Lord God, we are so very thankful for your love for us. We are so thankful, Lord, that regardless of what we've done, no matter how many times we fail, uh, Lord, your love never changes. You have always loved us maximally. We thank you, Lord, that our minds cannot even comprehend the love that you have for us. And Lord, we thank you for the ability to gather together here. We thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to celebrate our shared salvation, uh, to celebrate the hope that we have both now and forever. Lord, we're thankful that in seasons of unrest in our country, in our community, in our world, uh, Lord, that we could recognize the fact that we are anchored to the unchanging God. And so we thank you, Lord, that while uh, the waves crash upon us at times here in this world, we will never be sunk because our God is sovereign. And so, Lord, we thank you for that great hope in which we take joy today. And so, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word together. Lord, we don't just want to uh, read it. We don't just want to be inspired by it or encouraged by it or challenged by it. We want to be changed by it. And so, Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would work even in our hearts and minds right now, preparing us for your word. And Lord, help us to both come to understanding as well as to commit to change in those areas of life where you seek transformation for us. And we're thankful, Lord, that you do this in our hearts and minds as we surrender to you and as we acknowledge the authority of your scripture. And so, Lord, we love you and we praise you and everything that we do in this place today is for your honor and glory. And so, Lord, we ask that you, we would hope that you would be overjoyed by what takes place here as your people gather in your name. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, last week you heard a little snippet of my sermon, my sermon, no, you heard the whole sermon, but you heard a snippet of my testimony of coming to faith in Christ. Um, that first church that I was a part of, where I put my faith and trust in Christ, was an interesting church. Uh, there are elements of, of love and community that I have never seen in any other church I've been a part of. There are also some things that I didn't really agree with or I didn't really enjoy about that particular church. Um, one of the things was this. It did not take me long, once I began attending there, to realize that the pastor preached the majority of his sermons on one topic, the topic of forgiveness or unforgiveness, uh, more like. I kid you not, over 50% of the sermons that he preached were on that one topic. When I first recognized this, it was comical. My, my friend and I who would sit together in our, our church seats, we would look at each other and giggle when he started preaching because we knew the topic was going to be the same again. After a little while, it was no longer comical. It was kind of annoying. We've heard this already. You may have preached every sermon in the entire Bible that deals with this topic. A little while later, it became just outright frustration. And so finally, one day, I was in the church helping out with something, and it was just me and the pastor in the church. And so I figured I had to ask him about this. So I pull him aside, and I say, why do you preach so often on this particular topic of unforgiveness? And he said to me, it's because in my whole time as a Christian, I have recognized this as the number one stumbling block for Christians, the ability to forgive one another. Now, I don't agree with how often he preached on it. I don't know that I agree that it's the number one uh, problem that faces Christians, but it certainly is a big one. In fact, there hasn't been a single church that I've been a part of in my entire time as a Christian where I didn't know of people within the church, families within the church, groups within the church that held on to resentment against uh, others within the church. This really is an issue. Uh, and it is also the topic of the passage of Scripture that we're going to find ourselves in today. Uh, it'll be up on the screen. It's two short verses. Uh, but we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 17, verses 3 to 4. And so Jesus is talking, and he says this. He says, if your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day, and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. And so these two short verses pack quite a punch. Um, even if 
even if they sin against me more than once in the same day, seven times in the same day, we have to forgive them. These are pretty strong words. And if you remember from last week, uh, Jesus had some pretty strong words there as well. And so I want us to understand, first of all, what Jesus is talking about, who Jesus is talking about uh, as he's giving this instruction. He's giving this instruction to his followers, and he's giving them about his followers. In fact, the Greek word adelphos that's used here could just mean brother. It could be a literal biological sibling. Uh, but the context of this entire section uh, leads us to understand that he's talking about brothers and sisters in the faith, fellow disciples of Jesus, fellow believers. And so uh, if you happen to be an only child, this still applies to you because this is uh, all your brothers and sisters in Christ. And the reality of it is that we do sin against each other, don't we? Um, we're human. We are still, even now, having received new life in Christ, still battling that old self, right? Like we talked about last week, we're still in this journey of sanctification. And so we're still in this process of being made holy. And while we're still in process, we continue to sin. We continue in striving for righteousness to fall and sin. And when we do that, yes, of course, every sin is an offense to God. And yet when we really look at how the ways in which we sin, oftentimes the ways in which we sin are an offense to somebody else. Um, I've told you that in every single church that I've been a part of, whether I was in ministry in that church or not, I knew of families and people within the church uh, that had resentment toward one another for such offenses. Uh, I can give you two very quick examples, even from my own Christian journey. I remember being in church uh, with uh, Jenny's family and Jenny's family's friends, and the pastor, who I absolutely love and respect, is preaching, and yet something that he says I disagree with theologically. It wasn't even a minor point. It was something major, uh, and it bugged me that he said that. Now, he's human, I'm human, I'm sure that not everything I say at the pulpit is infallible, right? But after church, we got together for lunch with Jenny's family and Jenny's family's friends, and we started talking about the sermon. And so I decided I was going to bring up this point of contention. And one of Jenny's family's friends turned to me and snapped at me. She said, who do you think you are that you could disagree with the pastor? Whoa, hey. <laughs> Let's see, I'm a Christian. I have the Holy Spirit. I read the Bible. I could have an, an informed opinion here. Um, but the way she snapped at me, man, I carried that with me for years. In fact, it might be part of the drive for why I'm working on a PhD program. I'm going to get every single credential so that nobody can say, who are you? You want to see my resume? That's terrible. No, but, but seriously, right? I mean, I was sinned against in that moment, and it tracked with me for a while, and I had to work on forgiveness uh, in my own life. Uh, another example is I was, uh, try I was working with Youth for Christ and trying to raise support from my own uh, home church, and so I had to sit before the missions committee, and the five members of the missions committee were all there around the table with me, asking me questions about the ministry, uh, about what my hopes were, what the money would go for, those kinds of things. And you could tell that from left to right, we had supportive and encouraging, supportive and encouraging, supportive and encouraging. And then the one who's giving me evil eyes through the whole meeting, who does, wants nothing more than for me to walk out without any financial support. Uh, and she kept trying to steer the conversation. I have no idea why she didn't like me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yet, uh, she was being unfair through this whole thing, right? So we, we have these experiences, right? Raise your hand, please don't say a name, but raise your hand if somebody in the church, not just even our church, but a Christian brother or sister from any church has sinned against you that you remember, that you recognize. Raise your hand. Okay, the rest of you, once it percolates, the names will come to you. Um, because these are just the reality of living life with each other, right? Uh, if anybody who has a sibling, you know that you, can, that you could easily sin against other people in a relationship. Anybody who's married could easily know that you could sin against one another in a relationship, right? Uh, we're humans, and this is going to happen. And when it happens within the context of the church... If it's not dealt with appropriately, 
it could cause a lot of damage. And so Jesus' words are absolutely important, and we'll take a look at a couple uh, reasons why that is here in just a little bit. Right now, one of the things you may recognize, even just going on social media, is that everybody has an opinion about every single thing going on in the world. And even Christian brothers and sisters who love you and you love them, you disagree with them on one of these little points, and all of a sudden, anger flares up uh, in ways that it really ought not. And so uh, the reality is that Christians do sin against each other. I tried to pull a little bit of uh, statistical data. I like this kind of stuff. Now, I don't always like what the numbers tell me, but I like statistical data. Uh, and so when I put this in, uh, my Google search, I was actually a little scared at just how much data came up. But I'm going to give you two uh, different uh, data points, st statistics, over people who have left the church or people who have avoided the church. And the first one comes from Lifeway Research uh, from 2019. It says young adults, ages 23 through 30, who left the church, that's the, the group that it was polling, 32% of them left because church members seemed judgmental or hypocritical. Whew, that's a big number. Think about that. 32%, almost one-third of the young adults, ages 23 through 30, who left the church, left it for that reason. That whether specific instances or just the general impression is that church members, Christians, uh, were judgmental or hypocritical. Again, this issue of sinning against other Christians. A Barna article from 2010 says this, based on past studies of those who avoid Christian churches, okay, that's all people, not just young adults, uh, one of the driving forces behind such behavior is the painful experiences endured within the local church context. In fact, one Barna study among unchurched adults shows that nearly four out of every 10 non-church-going Americans, that's 37%, said they avoid churches because of negative past experiences in churches or with church people. So of those people who would claim that they are unchurched, they're not Christian, they don't go to church, they don't want any part of church, 37% of them have had some uh, instance, some uh, encounter with a Christian or with a church in their past that left a bad taste in their mouth. Um, the fact is Christians do sin against other Christians, and how we handle it is important. And so in our text today, Jesus gives a pattern, right? He gives a, he gives a method, if you will, of dealing with this issue. Uh, he says, if your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them, and if they repent, forgive them. So I want to look at this together today. Uh, the re what does a rebuke look like? What is a rebuke? Uh, um, uh, what, what, what about their repentance? And, and oh my goodness, we're, he's going to talk to us about forgiveness. I was hoping he'd skip that part. No, we're going to get to that too. Uh, so let's talk about rebuke. What does it mean to rebuke? Rebuke is calling evil evil, right? More specifically in this context, it's, it's calling out wrongdoing. Uh, a lot of times, here's what we do. Somebody sins against us. We don't say anything. We keep it to ourselves. We resent them. It festers. That's wrong. We have to say something, right? But how we say something is also important. Uh, I want to read this passage to you from Matthew 18, uh, verses 15 through 17. Uh, Jesus says this. He says, If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault. Okay, again, that's the same thing as he's saying in Luke, to rebuke them. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault. Just between the two of you. That does not mean blow them up on Facebook. Uh, does that does that, does, not, does not mean go gossip around all the other church members. Uh, just between the two of you, point out their fault. If they listen to you, you've won them over. If they will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And that does not mean gossip. That means bring in the elders or the pastor. Um, tell it to the church. And uh, if they still refuse to listen, uh, even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. So, again, the point here is the same as the other passage that we were looking at together in Luke. If somebody sins against you, you have to tell them. 
but do it just among the two of you in private, right? Because we're supposed to do it in such a manner that brings about restoration, that we're doing it out of love so there could be reconciliation between you and the person who sinned against you and between them and God and them and the church. It's about redemption in that moment, not about you know, blowing them up for what they've done to you. And then if that doesn't work, then bring two or three other Christian brothers or sisters together, not ones who are going to side with you, but ones who can objectively mediate between you and this other person in this situation. And if they still won't listen, then get your elders involved, get your pastor involved. And if that doesn't work, well, there you go. So first and foremost, there's a way, a right way in which we are to go about rebuking uh, a person when they sin against us. Uh, Also, always base your rebuke on scripture. Um, I remember, I'm going to use Grace as an example. I didn't clear this with her ahead of time, so I may get an earful later. Uh, But she said this openly in Sunday school, so it's fair game, Grace. Um, And that's this. So Grace told us that when she was a young girl, she went to church and she had makeup on. And somebody pulled her aside and laid into her because she wore makeup to church. Okay. To which I would say, please show me book, chapter, and verse. (laughs) Right? We love to rebuke people sometimes. But you know what? You can't rebuke them for things that they haven't really done wrong. Maybe they, maybe they did something wrong against your cultural norm, but you can't call something a sin if God doesn't call it a sin. We don't get to make up what's sin and what's not sin. And so when you rebuke somebody for sinning against you, be sure it's a sin, right? Use scripture always in your approach and your rebuke. We get this right from 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, a wonderful passage of scripture that talks about the nature of scripture itself and what its purpose is. And we see this, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, all scripture is God-breathed, is inspired by God, and is useful, because it's God-breathed, it's useful for teaching, rebuking correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible tells us to use the Bible for rebuking. It's in this that we know what's right and what's wrong so that when we come to a person who's done us wrong, we could say, listen, what you did offended me. Here's why. Here's how I know that it's wrong. And so we need to take some time here and confess this before the Lord and repent of this. Because we need to know it's in the scriptures. Here's the, here's the next bit on rebuking, all right? Rebuke with gentleness. We don't always do this. You hurt me, I want to hurt you. See, the Bible says I can tell you what you did wrong, so you're going to sit down and listen to it. No, that's really not how scripture tells us to do that. We need to rebuke with love. We need to rebuke with gentleness. Uh, we see this in Galatians 6.1. Paul's writing, he says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin... You who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves or you may also be tempted. And so again, the whole purpose of a rebuke is for restoration, for bringing the person back, for redemption between you and that person, between that person and God, and between that person and the Christian community. And so we need to do it rightly, out of love and with gentleness. And so again, this is why we rebuke. We rebuke so that they would come to repentance. And so let's talk about this whole idea of repentance, because Jesus said, if your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them, and if they repent, forgive them. And so repentance is the goal so that we can forgive. And so here we go. Uh, The goal of your rebuke is to lead them to repentance, to restoration with you and with God. And so repentance includes three things, maybe more, but I came up with three things. uh, Repentance includes acknowledgement of wrongdoing. Right? If somebody's going to truly repent of what they've done, then they have to acknowledge that they've done something wrong. Uh, it also shows sincere remorse for wrongdoing. Now, that doesn't mean you get to hold it over their head until they're groveling at your feet. That's not what this is saying. But they need to acknowledge wrongdoing, and they need to be remorseful. They need to recognize and be sorry for the fact that they've done something wrong. This is part of repentance. Uh, and finally, uh, a commitment to change one's ways. Now, remember that we're called in our relationship with God to live like this, to confess and to repent. And so 
It's good to remember those three components of repentance. This is what we hope for people when we rebuke them after they've done wrong to us, that they would acknowledge their sin, that they would be remorseful for having done it, and that they would want to change. And so this is what repentance is. And there are times when they're not going to do that, right? If you have a sibling, you know there are times they are not going to be repentant, even when you rebuke them. Um, this is going to happen sometimes. So what do you do when they're not willing to repent? Well, we already looked at that in Matthew chapter 18. Bring others to mediate, bring church elders, pastor to mediate, and go from there. Jesus gives us what to do if they don't repent. But the bigger question is, what do we do when they do repent? We have to forgive. Have to. There is no choice in the matter. It doesn't matter what the wrong is that they committed against you. And I know that in any group of people, including this group of people, there are people in our past who have wronged us severely. There are people who have wronged us in, so, in such ways that the damage left behind in our own lives tracked with us for a long time. Maybe we're still facing them today. And it's very easy for us to think that I could forgive this, this, and this, but I'll never forgive that. And Jesus doesn't give us that option. When they repent, we are responsible to forgive. So let's ask this question. Why? Why must we forgive? Besides just Jesus said so, right? Well, that's the first one. Obedience to Christ. He's our Lord, right? When we pray, placed our faith and trust to Jesus, we surrendered to the Lordship of Christ. Romans 10.9 says, if you uh, confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, right? L Lordship of Christ is necessary for our salvation. So we've already taken that oath. We've already made that commitment. Christ is our Lord. Therefore, when our Lord says to do something, we do it. And so first, yes, we do it out of obedience to Christ. But we also do it because we're called to love our brothers and sisters. We're called to love all people. But Jesus talks about, uh, the Bible talks about, because it's also in the epistles, that by loving our brothers and sisters in Christ, we demonstrate our love for God, and we demonstrate that we're his people, right? Uh, Jesus says, by this, they'll know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And so we are called to love our brothers and sisters in Christ, even when they're not very lovable. And so this is another reason why we must forgive. The another reason is that we have been forgiven much. It's so easy for us to lose sight of the fact that God has forgiven us in Christ for every single wrongdoing that we have done in our lives, every wrong action, every wrong thought, every wrong word, every wrong motivation. And I'll tell you, I took math, right, for all of, you know, all the way up through senior in high school. I took some math classes in college. And I can tell you that if I were to answer honestly, I don't think the numbers go up high enough to cover all the sins that God has forgiven of me in my life. Think about it. The quantity of sins that God has forgiven for each and every one of us. The quality of sins that God has forgiven of each and every one of us. And you may be a good person compared to that person or a good person compared to that person. And yet all of us are utterly wicked and have done things to completely uh, spit in the face of our, our holy God. Uh, and God has forgiven us all of this in Jesus Christ. And so who are we not to forgive as we have been forgiven? Because everything that we do in ministry to one another comes out of the overflow of our relationship with God. If you don't have an intimacy with Christ, if you don't study the scriptures, if God isn't pouring into you, you have nothing to give to anybody else. But think about how much you have already been given in the forgiveness that you received by God in Jesus Christ. And so we have more than enough when we recognize what we have been forgiven to then forgive other people for their wrongdoing against us. And another reason is because unforgiveness dam does damage to the body of Christ. Again, this particular text that we're looking at in the Gospel of Luke talks about brothers and sisters in Christ as in members of Christ's body, of which he is the head. And so it's the same as a hand doing damage to a side or, uh, you know, uh, 
cutting off your own foot, when you are doing damage to the body, when we hold on to unforgiveness and resentment toward another part of the body. The purposes for which Christ has endowed his church, his body, cannot possibly be accomplished maximally if we are holding on to grudges against other parts of the body. We cannot function here as a local church. We cannot function as part of the greater church if we are holding bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness toward other members within the body of Christ. We will never be able to accomplish the purposes God has for us. And so we need to uh, forgive one another. And another thing that struck me even this morning is this, that unforgiveness presumes to hold someone in judgment whom God has forgiven. If you are in Christ, you have been forgiven. If your brother or sister in Christ, again, in Christ, sins against you, they have been forgiven by God. Jesus died on the cross to pay the price for the sin that they committed. And so in that, and what, we're, what we're doing in this moment is saying that, well, God may forgive you, but I'm not. And if God can forgive, who are we to hold somebody in judgment? We can't do it. We must forgive. So here's a question. Why is forgiveness so hard? Raise your hand if forgiveness is easy. It's not easy. It's not easy. You know, that my, maybe my pastor was on to something when he was preaching it every week. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard. There's times when I have forgiven somebody of a wrongdoing, or at least believed I did. And then all these feelings start rushing up again sometime in the future when I think about the wrong that they've done against me. It is hard to forgive. And some people were tempted to just not be willing to forgive. Why is it so hard? Are we afraid that justice will not be served? This is one reason, right? Perhaps we're afraid that justice is not going to be served. It seems like an injustice that that person should be forgiven after what they've done to me. But here's the thing. Their debt was paid. Jesus literally hung on a cross to pay the price for that sin. Not only that, we as Christians will be held accountable for our sin. We're not going to be separated from God. If you are in Christ, then his blood covers you. You are justified before God. When you stand before his throne, you will be with him. You are going to be found not guilty, not because you were perfect, but because Christ was. But still, we are going to be held accountable to how we lived in this new life that he's given us, right? There'll be rewards or demerits, if you will, inherent and in heaven based on how we live. And so there will be accountability. It's, God is a God of perfect justice. There will still be justice. Uh, so what are we afraid of? Are we afraid that justice will not be served? Well, that's not the case. Are we afraid they'll do it again? If I forgive them this time, they're just going to do it again. They're going to walk all over me. Well, a couple things about this. Number one, Jesus already said, if they do it again and again and again and again and again, you're going to keep forgiving them. If you think about it this way, we talked, I talked very openly last week about my journey of overcoming sin, of which I'm not even close to the finish line. How many times after God has given me new life in Christ, after God has forgiven me all of my sins, do I do it again? And I do it again. And I do it again again and yet his forgiveness is perfect and he through that process is sanctifying me making me holy and if we trust that god is working the same process in somebody else then we owe it to god to forgive that person that he might work in their hearts and minds and transform them into the image of his son god is working sanctification in his people and so if we're afraid that they're going to do it again, yeah, they may. And they may do it again, and they may do it again. But ultimately, God will work in their hearts and minds and change them. And you are our instrument in that when you forgive. Why is forgiveness so hard? Maybe it's a matter of pride. I don't like being taken advantage of. I don't like being wronged. Well, get over it. <laughs> pride is our issue. It's not their issue. We know what we're called to do. Is it a matter of hurt feelings? Hey, hurt feelings are hurt feelings. And yet, God heals. He comforts. And he'll bring you past it. But don't try to stand in the way of his redeeming people. And Jesus warns about unforgiveness. And I, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about this passage. 
Maybe it puts it all in perspective. Maybe it's the kick of the pants we all need when it comes to this issue of forgiveness. This is Jesus' uh, parable in Luke, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 and following. It'll be up on the screen. This is the parable of the unmerciful servant who says this. It says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Uh Uh-oh, if you thought the Luke passage was hard, you got to times it by 10 here, buddy. Uh, He goes on, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. First of all, just so you know, that's an amount that cannot possibly be paid back in the lifetime of this servant. Verse 25, since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins, a very small amount by comparison. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he, pay, until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. In case you thought there was some gray area before, there isn't. Because we literally, well, we metaphorically spit in God's face every time we withhold forgiveness from somebody else while trying to receive the forgiveness that he gave to us. We are called unequivocally to forgive those who have sinned against us and repent. Again, Jesus' words in Luke 17, if your brother or sister sins against you, which they will, rebuke them appropriately. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. And as you do, you put the grace of God on display. You aid the person in this process of God working in their hearts to bring about sanctification. You reconcile them to yourself, to God, and to the community of believers. And you have taken a terrible situation, and you have given it over to God, and he will use it for his glory and for the betterment of the church and for the church to be able to fulfill its purpose that God has given it. What a beautiful picture. And if we ever lose sight of this in the moment, because we've all been hurt by people in the past, we've all, and it hurts even more when it's a fellow brother or sister in Christ. It does, because you feel like this is a safe space, and those are people who should care about you more than anybody. Um, They understand you more than perhaps other people who you're close to because they share in the salvation, and it hurts so much more when they have sinned against you. And yet, these are those moments when we recognize the extent of what God did for us by forgiving us, and we give it over to him, and he will honor your forgiveness. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for the forgiveness that you have extended to us, not because we deserved it, not because we're good people, but because you chose to. We thank you, Lord, that you sent your son, Jesus, to pay the price on the cross for all of our sins that we might be forgiven. And so, Lord, we received grace and mercy when we didn't deserve it. We received forgiveness when we didn't deserve it. We received reconciliation when we didn't deserve it. We received adoption as your sons and daughters when we didn't deserve it. Lord, we thank you for your forgiveness that you have extended to each and every one of us. 
And Lord, if there's any among us here this morning that has not yet surrendered to the Lordship of Christ, who has not yet believed in and recognized the fact that Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead to secure their salvation, to secure their forgiveness, Lord, may you demonstrate to their hearts and minds right now the loving forgiveness that you have offered freely. And Lord, help us not to take it for granted. Help us not to forget about it in moments when brother sins against brother or sister sins against sister. Lord, we're just human and we're all on this journey of sanctification and we will inevitably uh, offend one another. Lord, may you give us extra grace in those times to rebuke well, to come to repentance when we recognize we've sinned, and Lord, to forgive others who've sinned against us. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.